So, uh, first of all, I want to take this uh, opportunity to thank you all for being here, uh, and also to thank uh, University of Kent in Brussels for uh, having me. It's always a pleasure to be here, and especially uh, being from UNB, I'm glad to see that there are quite a few uh, UNB doctoral students here, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so today, uh, as you know, um, the University of Kent uh, public lecture series is hosting uh, Professor Oliver Richmond, uh, who is a um, research professor at Manchester University in international relations and uh, peace and conflict studies, uh, and who uh, you probably know has written a lot about uh, liberal peace building, uh, the politics of state building, uh, the concept of peace, etc. And which is quite fortunate since today he's going to talk about peace in the 21st century, progress and order in the age of intervention. Uh, the way we we're going to organize this today is that uh, Professor Oliver Richmond will have uh, about 50 minutes for his presentation, uh, followed by a Q&A session uh, of about half an hour. Um, after which I will ask all of you to stay since there is a reception, I've been told, uh, not too far from here thereafter, so please stay after the Q&A session. Uh, Oliver Richmond, the floor is yours. Thank you. Going to the microphone. Ah, <coughs> Hello, everyone. It's very nice to uh, be here. This is the, um, <coughs> the continental end of my own university, which you know is the uh, University of Kent, um, long ago. So it's very nice to be here to give this talk. Um, you know, some of which is um, beholden to um, debates that John Groom and others were having with John Burton and Keith Webb and Andy Williams and Vivian Jabbery and uh, Chris Mitchell um, in an earlier generation or an earlier invocation of this discussion about uh, where international order and peace and so on um, would come from. I'd like to start off with um, just a couple of um, kind of uh, pre addendums if that's possible to this. The first is that um, going back to the late 1890s, um, into the 1920s and 30s, there was a genre of international history writing, if you like, um, which was connected with switched on, um, connected with. Do I say it all again? Yeah. <laughs> did, did you hear any of that? So there was a genre of writing, analysis, and commentary, which was all about um, the building of an international system which would preserve order, which would demilitarize, which would remove weapons from general circulation, which would advance the cause of human emancipation, particularly with the use of um, technology. And a lot of this writing, people like H.G. Wells, um, for example, were an addictive of it, um, was aimed at uh, producing a world government. The idea being, back at this, at this time, in this particular era, uh, we've been through a cycle of colonial wars, um, both for and against colonialism, um, believe it or not. Um, Afghanistan was a case in point. And um, there had been massive technological advancements, much of which had been harnessed not just by capital, but by the state. And the state had used this advancement in order to refine the ways in which it gathered resources from the people, from society, not just through taxation, but also through labor, um, so this is the industrial momentum um, building up. Um, building up is security and military apparatus, and we know where that led. It led to World War I and again World War II, and numerous other um, related and subsequent um, conflicts too. So there was this body of writing which emerged, um, touching on technological matters, touching on ideological matters, um, touching on questions of norms, preferences, international law, the whole point being to try to come up with a system of world government which would translate the growing claims of societies around the world for emancipation. And emancipation I'm using as a very loose term, meaning social justice, equalization, access to um, resources and services, as well as some kind of celebration of um, identity. Um, but at the global scale, the idea being that one had to create an international architecture which would lock in the um, stabilizing functions of the state against its own internal warlike capacities, that is the industrial capacity to circulate arms and make war, as well as to guarantee the rights of society, the individual, and the subject 
So in that very Eurocentric Enlightenment linear way, people at HG Wells were imagining how the Victorians emancipated the subject while you know, covertly going around colonizing the world um, and raising, raising revenues in order to further emancipate the domestic subject. Um, refining the states by looking back particularly at European political philosophy and what it had to say about human rights, um, democracy, and norms. And then adding to this system an international governance framework. They would lock each other into place. So this is a kind of technical, mechanical understanding about how world politics would work in order to remove violence, end war, and to divert resources into productive processes. That was what liberal internationalism really was based on. This was the whole point of liberal internationalism. That was one utopian project for world order. There were others at the time, notably Marxism. So that's, that's sort of one, I think, key thing that we, um, we need to remember. Back in 100 years ago today, around people were already thinking about the relationship between industrialization, forms of political structure, intervention, and technology. And some people were using those for the project of peace, which they would translate into something like world governments. Others, of course, were using it for the projects of war. And, of course, the cruel status and power um, for the state. Now, the second thing I want to say, I think this is a theme which is something which we need to um, also consider here um, in this sort of hundred year sweep of international history, political theory, international relations, um, and so on, is that when people like Wells and, and many others, sort of the pacifists and the peaceniks of the 19 teens, the, um, the free marketeers from the 1880s um, onwards, the great liberal rights thinkers who eventually gave rise to the Declaration of Human Rights in the 1940s and so on, when they were thinking about progress at that time, it was very clear that they had some sense of the structural obstacles that would have to be overcome in order to induce progress. And the great ideologies of the 20th century, Marxism um, as well as liberalism, both had a sense at that time that the human subject, that is us, um, was prone to relaxing into a bucolic and pastoral state of non-productivity. And that if we were able to exercise our own agency freely, we would opt for the path of least resistance, that is the path of no resistance. We would not be politicized, we would not act, and we would not um, work together for progress. There would be no international cooperation and little domestic cooperation. And this is a kind of a mentality which saw the world as a bounded structural space. There are material limitations, geographic, geopolitical uh, limitations. They are harsh structures which cannot be overcome. And part of that are the limitations of human capital itself. But this is something that could be overcome given the right politics. So a lot of the debates in that period, we see it in the ideological debates in the Cold War too, was about how you use power that accrues to the state as the site of industrial power in modern world order, the main site of industrial power, in order to hold back stru structural obstacles to order, geopolitical, uh, material, resource obstacles, and to bring on the human population into a higher state of being. So early understandings of progress saw nature as a limitation, but technology and ideology and institutions and law as a way in which one could not overcome nature, but hold it at bay. So if we go back to those periods, you could interpret the history, the pre-war and interwar struggles, both of militarism and global capital, as struggles over progress. Struggles over what it means and what type of tools are legitimate and necessary to make a world order which is better than the previous.
better than the previous epoch. And all of these approaches had some sense of the international, had a very specific sense of the state, and had a very specific understanding of the position of the subject. For some, the international was an imperial space. For others, it was the UN, the liberals, um, for example. For others, it was a space of global capital. For some, the state was a state which redistributed material resources, but didn't provide fundamental philosophical rights, or rather saw material resources as trumping those rights. But other, for others, the social was a material resource which had to be manipulated, developed and advanced. Whereas for others, the social was a, a site of authority and legitimacy which deserved autonomy and rights. Now to cut a long story short, we could bring all of these projects forward 100 years to the end of the, the Cold War. And what we see, I think, is a kind of hybrid of this thinking. We begin to see a merging of thinking about progress and progressive politics. That is, what is required for the state and the international to move, move humanity from the, the feudal land or the industrial urban into this service post-industrial modernity. How the state should lock in that progress how the international should regulate the state, and how all of this at the same time would produce an order which we could define as peaceful, harmonious, or at least pacific. Now, clearly for that to happen, in order to, let's say, um, meet the objectives of that liberal internationalist dream of the early, early 20th century, there was another vital factor which was intervention. So to construct a peace system in modernity, one needed to connect with these different traditions of progress, which looked at society, capital, institutions, law, identity, and technology, and scaled them from the local to the international. And then one had to construct a system in which intervention should and could legitimately occur to maintain that system and to advance it. And to cover a long story short, because I don't have much time, I would say, with swings and roundabouts and ups and downs, you could see that that's how the scheme of the 20th century develops until the end of the Cold War. And by the time we get to the point where we're all sitting in classes of international relations, um, in the 1990s or 2000s, thinking about intervention, we're talking about these particular tools, humanitarian intervention, peace building, peacekeeping, state building, mediation, negotiation, development, um, arbitration, and so on. Now, all of these tools are designed in a way to bring forward that project, to lock in, to make it stable, but also to make it possible its advancement. If you want to take a bird's eye view, a grand view of those different forms of intervention in general terms, we could say that what was happening at the international level, driven by some key states, we now call them the donor states, the OECD, the main donors, um, and so on, was an attempt to negotiate a right of intervention. And this right of intervention was designed to maintain peace, order, and security. But here's the big caveat. This is a peace, an order system, and a security framework which has a strict rationality and a fairly strict hierarchy. In other words, it's about a parallel process of locking in hierarchy while also producing change. This is where we get to, I think, the liberal peace system of the 1990s with its possibilities for human emancipation in terms of rights and developments, the rule of law and all of this stuff, but also with its internal contradictions that is built on historical and colonial system. It's also partly, partly built historically 
on socialism. It tries to draw all these things together. The UN system itself is built on certain key states' dominance in different aspects of international affairs. So in a way, the genius of that moment was that it brought together these countervailing forces of history, of agency, of institutions and actors, and put them into a fairly common project. The political liberalism project of that era was so broad that almost anyone could fit into it, as long as they weren't necessarily communist um, or aspiring to a non-secular ideology and so on, which seems from the bird's eye view of that moment to, to fit rather nicely with the way in which history turned out in the 1990s. So the question in the 1990s was how does one preserve the impetus, those different strands of the progressive impetus of what became to be known as liberal internationalism in the uh, 18, late 1800s onwards, how does one update it produce a system which actually contradicts some of its own foundational norms, for example, that of sovereignty and territorial integrity, which therefore has, if not a formal, but an informal right of intervention in which the world policeman can police the system, police the, the order. And the next question for the scholars is, how do we evaluate this evolution? Is it ethical? Is it actually progressive? Is it likely to be stable? And does it do what it says on the tin? Provide rights, redistribute resources, maintain order in the longer term. Now what we see then in this um, period is, just to break, roughly break it down, we see the emergence of these tools, peacekeeping and mediation were ones that are commonly talked about in discipline, seem referred to you know, inevitably and over and over again um, in the UN system and amongst the donors and so on. And what they're doing is they're rehearsing a narrative from the late 1950s onwards, which is really about how the more powerful adjust the international order to improve stability in the face of a whole series of risks. Now, the, the later story has often been that peacekeeping mediation was all about human rights and, and development and you know, providing a stable basis for a viable liberal state to, um, to emerge. But if you go back to the documentary evidence, that's not really all that clear. I mean, it's very clearly a balancing act, a, a security act, um, in some ways quite a feudal process in which the key states intervene against those states that threaten regional or indeed global interests um, or stability. So I think we should be wary, wary of reading those types of activities as civilizing in that civilizing mission um, term. <coughs> However, that changes. I think when we get to the next phase, the next step in this attempt to claim a right of intervention, this liberal peace step is much more invasive. It's not just military. It's not just diplomatic, as peacekeeping and mediation were. It's not just run mainly um, from the international parts of the global architecture. So this liberal peace system becomes more dependent upon the state, in particular state donors. Remember, the old peacekeeping system was not dependent on key states in the international system. In fact, it excluded them from those um, activities, at least on, on paper. It tried to move beyond the old norms of sovereignty, in which certain elite forms of status enabled discourse. It also moved into the informal, or the private sectors, with its engagement with global civil society, with NGOs, um, and so on. And what we can see here is a particular logic of the advancement of this right to intervene. The right to intervene is becoming a bit more fuzzy, it's becoming more widely spread, but it advances the idea that there are certain levels of international politics. They go from the citizen, to the state, to the regional organization, to the international. And what we need to see Across all of those levels, if there is to be progress, is an attempt to bring them all into line with each other, normatively, legally, economically, institutionally, and perhaps even socially. So 
And a more extreme critique would say, would say this is about eradicating difference, making us all the same in order, in order that we can agree in these different terrains of international relations. It makes agreements more, it makes agreement much easier if we are agreeing across similarity rather than, if you like, mediating across difference, which was the, the previous story. Now, very roughly, we could say that this uh, liberal peace system experimented, which is you know, rather unethical, but it did experiment on human subjects in many countries around the world, um, from um, Central America um, to Cambodia, and of course, right the way through to um, Timor and Kosovo um, by the end of the 1990s into the 2000s. And every time it intervened, every time it became involved in this whole team of international civil servants, of international mediators, of officials, of non-governmental organizations, economic advisors, security personnel, mm -hmm. the whole team of programming officers, this is the technological aspect, descended upon these conflict-affected societies in order to bring them into this putative liberal international community. They would start to experience resistances. And resistances began to emerge in multiple areas. Some of them were connected to the outright claim that this process of intervention and the appended progressive system that was being brought in with liberal peace building would not deal with historical injustice. So this was year zero, 1990s onwards, and anything that happened before was not really on the table of law. The second claim was this claim about homogenous identities that what we should do is create some sense of the nation or the national to make people pull together within the framework of the states and to pull them away from old tribal, customary, feudal and other or religious forms of identity. So this wasn't about mediating across difference, it was about making everyone the same, experiencing citizenship in the same way within the rights regimes um, and so on. The third claim that was being made was that the liberal states can contribute to regional security. And regional security would be good for everybody, particularly the citizens on the ground. Now, all of these claims, I think, were fairly easily um, disputed on a one-to-one -one basis. But in general terms, they all held some potential. Perhaps the most controversial of the claims was the claim that was made, or was being made, about capital. Now, over and over again, in this period, we see intervention in conflict-affected societies which bring into that political space an idea of capital arrangements which is either against the normative or ideological preferences of those societies um, or has, is not based on consultation. In other words, capital is no longer a political issue under these forms of liberal peace intervention. So when one votes, and the, the first Liberal Peace Act is voted, we see the holding of elections being one of the key sites around which progress is um, developed. We don't see any discussion about the nature of the economic system in that process, time after time after time. So we can read this right of intervention in several different ways according to each of those different areas, and they all show possibilities, but also problems. I think by the late 1990s, we start to see um, so many problems with this system that the legitimacy, leg legitimacy of this claim, this claim that we have the right to intervene to deal with conflict affected societies, being seriously undermined. And by the time we get to um, the 2000s, and you have the two big test cases of the 2000s, the two big experiments, if you like, like Iraq and Afghanistan, it's very clear that the model has changed. A liberal peace building is really now in the dustbin of history. And what we're actually talking about is neoliberal state building, which is kind of retraction. I think it's a ret retrogressive state. What we're saying is, in the light of historical evidence from 1990s onwards, Identity is too problematic. Culture and identity means that rights as universal claims are likely to be contested. 
We're also saying that physical institutions are connected organically and therefore, in other words, to the territory, to the population, and therefore interventions which are designed to build institutions will necessarily step on the problem of difference, will give rise to um, resistance. We're still saying we won't deal with historical injustice through these interventions, so 1990 is still year zero, there'll be no attempt to deal with what happened before, which means no attempt to deal with root causes of the conflict, inadvertently, by the way. So the state that we're left with, the process that we're left with in this neoliberal state building period, is really an attempt to build a state which just focuses on security. But this is outwards looking security, not inwards looking security. And the mobility of capital. And this is deemed to be, so this is called, we can call this neoliberal state building. This is deemed to be a shortcut to deal with many of the problems that arose from 1990s onwards. The state didn't have legitimacy and political authority because it did too much. It stepped across identity. It didn't necessarily provide rights. So let's forget rights. Maybe even let's forget democracy. What we really need to do is provide a secure environment in which capitals can circulate. And then these other things, the more normative endeavours, can come later. And as long as we can construct a mode of intervention which stabilizes the region, then the chances are this international community can claim to have political legitimacy and therefore legitimate authority in world affairs. Now, the one common thing you can see throughout all of this evolution from the 1920s and H.G. Wells all the way through to um, neoliberal state building today is the attempt to maintain this claim to legitimate authority at the international level. There's something very important about it. There's something which gives a form of authority, a form of status, rights, access, influence, which is deemed to be very significant, shaping world order, influencing the nature of the state, influence, influencing what happens with material resources, and so on. And that, I think, is why so many of these um, projects for international order, peace and security in the last hundred years keep ending up with the international. Now, the international, as it would be envisioned under the liberal peace, was going to be something like a cosmopolitan form of world government. And we, you know, we almost got close to it with the Millennium Assembly and all of the institutions that seem to be forming um, around that. The, the system of governance which comes out of the neoliberal state is very different. You know, we would call that globalization you know, global governance this looser, decentralized, but still quite hegemonic in some ways, um, system which is in which the state, as a concrete eternal entity, is actually shaped by capital, not by its own population or rights. And that's a very different system. So what we need to think about then, right now, and this is really the point of all of this, um, is what does it mean for the project of peace? What does it mean for thinking about how international orders of the state and the social um, construct peace, maintain it, and also envision progress, the evolving project of peace? So back in the um, 19 teens, the liberal thinkers of the day, the liberal internationalist thinkers of the day, and other visionaries of that era were thinking about social agency in various forms, whether it's class or capital or normative or technological and how it would be scaled up to the international in order to produce a constitutional framework at the international which would regulate all forms of human behavior from the social to, to the state. That was the project of world government. Um, what seemed to be happening in this liberal peace period was a kind of envisioning of some kind of global, decentralized, federated parliamentary system, very similar um, in, in some ways. What we seem to be seeing under the neoliberal state building agenda is a very decentralized understanding of global order, um, a, a non-normative, capital and security oriented understanding of peace. And therefore the main institutions around those two frameworks would be designed in ways which would not touch upon 
the rigorous constitutional frameworks that a world government would need. Something pretty much like as, as we have. Now, the, the question for both of those is, are they capable of maintaining order? Are they capable of dealing with the, the things that create conflict in the modern world? Or are they relics of a past world, a world which is now gone, the 20th century, the 19th century, um, and so on? So if we were sitting here today, which is what I'm standing here today, thinking about what a peace project would be, which would connect these strands of thinking, the social, the state, the international, progress, peace, and intervention. Intervention inevitably being empirically tested necessary for peace and progress. How would it look? Where is it going? Now, I don't want to speculate. There's been lots and lots of um, speculation about this um, throughout history, you know, from um, Plato and Cicero um, to the, the neocons of uh, recent times. But what I will say is that there are some ways in which we can think about peace which perhaps will help us look at this debate. I have been working along with um, other colleagues. I don't know whether you can see this. You probably can't actually, so I'll just explain it. But if you want this overhead, just send me an email or I'll give it to somebody and you can distribute it. What we've been seeing in the really existing actual production of world order is not some utopian form of world governments or even, or even global governments. Not something which can be delineated, written about, described, captured in charts like this. What we've been seeing are a series of encounters complex encounters. And so the concept which I've been using to try and capture the complexity, but also the reality of these encounters is a hybrid piece. And if you look at the last 25 years of engagements with peace, peace building, state building, development, all that stuff, peacekeeping to some degree as well, humanitarian intervention, what we can see is not the production of a liberal state, or even a neoliberal state, certainly not the production of a liberal international order, or a specific type of advanced capitalist society, but a wide range of variations according to context, positionality, location, access to resources, cultural identity, religion, and so on. There's what we're seeing is a circulation of a whole range of factors which determine, for a fleeting moment, the nature of the institution, the nature of law, um, the nature of the way in which we see rights and identity, and so on. So there's a lot of fluidity in this system. So we can call this hybridity. But in hybridity, we can also see the state, the international, the local. We can also see the continuing connections between historical moments and the contemporary time, in other words, historical justice or historical injustice. We can see the impacts of structure, whether it's geopolitics or resource based or territorial, environmental, and so on. But these are real material impacts on the modern world. And they're all mixed up. And they all help determine the positionality of each subject, that's us, or each state, and the nature of the international order. So the question here is how do we evaluate this? And against what? So I said earlier that the early ambition of liberal internationalism and those other isms in the 20th century was in some way to make peace and order of a progressive type, according to its own definitions, within the constraints of nature, within natural limitations. Now, what we see increasingly, I think from the 2000s, perhaps even from the 1990s, is an attempt to think about human progress through intervention, in which the state is maintained, the international is maintained, but these now transcend nature. So we're now thinking about forms of outcome, institutions, rights, technology, ways in which we deal with identity and so on, which actually go way beyond the old categories which we deem to be connected with nature, the fixed structural categories of resource distribution, population, placement, um, institutional architecture, and so on. So to, to make it easy, 
Because in the end, you know, us, us scholars have to produce some types of categories or labels in order to produce some form of understanding of what's happening and how it might be thought of and evaluated and so on. I decided that I would divide this hybrid peace phenomena, that is, the types of peace systems, agreements, constitutions, um, legal frameworks, the nature of the states, and the convoluted and complex nature of the international, into two rather simple categories, which I, I've laid out here. They're both categories of hybrid peace, that is, the interaction, the encounter of the different power structures, different normative preferences, different positionalities, um, and different access to resource frameworks, and so on, identities. We can categorize these as negative or positive forms of hybrid peace. And that means that we have to start thinking about, again, we have to start thinking about what peace, progress, and intervention mean and are related to in the contemporary era. So the hybrid piece represents, I think, a kind of understanding of what actually happened in countries like Kosovo or Timor-Leste or Cambodia or El Salvador um, or Liberia or Sierra Leone, when the internationals post-1990 began to get interested in reforming the social, building the state, and anchoring it into the international architecture of institution, law, and capital. Now, what the internationals expected, or at least what they hoped for, was that they would have homogenous units entering into the global economy, into the UN system, and also engaging with their citizens in very similar ways, standardizable, universal, normative frameworks of engagement. What's actually happened is a very wide variation of identity mixes of identities, norms, legal systems, constitutional frameworks, notions of statehood, um, distributions of territory, regional positionality, and so on. So we can call this a hybrid piece. In many cases, to simplify, you could say that these states actually are kind of authoritarian quasi-authoritarian, slightly human rights oriented, very capitalist hybrid. And quite often, the formal structure of the state, the place where power, resources, rights, and capital is located, floats some way above the general population. Now, the general population exists in a slightly different but linked universe, where many of the understandings of norms, rights, secularity, um, uses capital for development purposes um, are quite different. So we have a gap, a legitimacy gap emerging between the societies, the conflict effects of societies which have been intervened upon during this period, the types of state that has emerged in an attempt to balance the elites, their preferences, interests, and power with the goals of, the social goals, if you like, as well as the aspirations of the international community for that state and society. So what's, what's emerging is quite different to the blueprint, in inverse commas, that was expected. So we can call this a hybrid piece. It's something like a negative piece, um, in some senses, in other senses, something like a positive piece. It combines many local, with transversal or transnational, as well as international, Preferences. It also tries to buy off state elites and the powers that control or have controlled historically um, resources in that particular territory. And the interesting thing about hybridity, because it's subjective in, in many senses, it's about an encounter in which power relations are maintained, is that depending on one's positionality, one can see the hybrid piece, let's say from below, as negative, but from above as positive, or vice versa. So it introduces a level of subjectivity into the space about political order and the order that's being created, which I think is um, quite important. So I can distribute more about this. Uh, I can distribute this, these overheads for you if you're interested in seeing the detail of this little chart. But um, just to cut a long story short, what I'm trying to say here is that the, the encounter is not producing something like a liberal state um, or a liberal international community. But that's still there and those traditions maintain. Um, but it's also not rescuing 
the organic functions of political society, but some of them are still there and still the same. And it's producing a situation where communities are able to pick and choose where they get their rights, identity, resources, understand, understandings of progress, and even intervention from. It's producing a kind of complex global marketplace of peace, progress, and intervention. Interlocking systems of peace. Interlocking sites of political authority, some of which can intervene in certain ways, others can't, or use different um, methods. And this is becoming a rather fluid system. Now, <clears throat> the problem with all of this is that policymakers don't like it. It's complex. It implies that the local is in, as important as the state or the international. It doesn't put power, authority, or legitimacy, or rights into a neat location which can then be administered or governed. And they think that it's led to a loss of legitimacy for intervention in this last seven or eight years in particular. So what we're seeing, remember I said that you know, part of the liberal internationalist dream, part of the UN system, liberal peace building, you know, liberal state building, all that stuff, was about building an increasingly legitimate right to intervene to maintain and improve the system on the part of this alphabet suit of international organizations, transnational organizations, INGOs, local NGOs, good donors, um, and all the rest of it. Now, many of these actors feel that, like that right of intervention, whether it's a development right, or a peacekeeping right, um, or something to do with one of the programs of peace, rule of law programming, or DDR, or SSR, and so on and so forth. It's been lost. That the, the site of legitimate authority that that came from has not only lost its capacity to act in the last decade, or slightly less, but it's also lost its right to act. It's lost its legitimacy to act. So R2P, which was in some ways the most advanced attempt to make a claim of a right to intervention, has become a dirty word in many of the countries, a dirty term in many of the countries around the world because it's against sovereignty, it's against territorialism, um, it's against existing power structures. So, what would they do? If they were thinking um, in those visionary terms of those early 20th century thinkers who were trying to, in the face of growing industrialization of power, the militarization of, of the state, the growing threats of nationalism, and fascism, what do you do if you are to rescue a right of intervention which protects peace, order, and progress? And of course, the situation is slightly different today. We're not faced maybe with quite the same risks or threats, but there is a, a sense that legitimacy of that project is ebbing away. Now, I would say that, well, there are several issues here that, that international policy planners in the UN, in the World Bank, in different institutions, um, amongst key donors are concerned with. They're concerned with increasing resistance amongst populations to their models and to their engagements. That to them is an embarrassment <coughs> because they are also preaching rights and democracy. How does one explain the bunkerization and the fortification of intervention of development actors and humanitarian actors? in conflict affected societies around the world. Why is it that all of these modes of intervention are becoming targets? That's pretty embarrassing, I think, for many, um, I mean, to greater or lesser degrees. It depends whether you come from UNDP or from the World Bank or um, from a particular national donor. Um, some of them are less embarrassed about the bunkerization of aid and development and peacekeeping and so on. So there's a problem of resistance, which is also connected to a loss of, of legitimacy. There's also a problem of a widely noted problem related to the issue with UN reform, a lack of political will, which is then connected to a loss of material capacity. In other words, the practices of intervention are losing the material resources they need to be able to impose their progressive will on the conflict affected subjects around the world. Also, 
conflict is changing. Now, back in the 1990s, you know, just at the end of the Cold War, we were all talking about how war had changed from interstate war to civil war, or civil war with a mix of transnational crime, the so-called um, new wars. Yet a lot of what is being um, discussed amongst the local counterparts of international policy planners when they meet them are structural issues. Even though the headlines show you know, that the violence in um, Libya or Iraq or Syria um, and so on, there is a much more broadly discussed kind of dripping issue, lower key issue of structural violence, which has risen up the agenda. And of course, to engage with structural violence, to engage with development issues, with the maldistribution of, of rights, with the maldistribution of natural resources, um, with the obstacles of access and mobility that the world's populations face in different quarters, requires a quite a different type of strategy from the standard development to peacekeeping to peace building to state building practices, the tools that they have negotiated for themselves and carved out of international politics um, over the last 25 years. So what seems to be being discussed, and I'm only really inferring from here, from gossip and, and rumours that I hear from people who claim that they are in some way significant, influential or in various different planning or coordination groups in different institutions um, around the world. It's a kind of, what, I'm not using this term by the way, I, I made it up because it just sounds relevant, but they seem to be discussing a kind of revolution in peace building. Revolution in peace building developments and humanitarianism. A bit like the old revolution in military affairs that we had a lot about in the late 1990s, where the world's um, key militaries tried to reorient their practices and capacities away from old wars to new wars. So today the world's interventionists who are interested in development, peace building, planning, humanitarianism and all the rest of it, are reorienting um, their thinking and their engagements away from a world in which there are subjects out there who do not resist, who welcome intervention, but also welcome the expertise that's brought with it, and also are willing to give up their autonomy in order to be developed, to have peace built, to have the state built. This means that they have to rethink what it means to make peace, build a state, and intervene in a world in which people have agency and resist. And that resistance has been quite effective. It's induced hybridity, the hybrid peace in negative and positive forms. They have to intervene in a world in which global capital is no longer quite as credible an argument as it used to be for economic reform. They have to intervene in a world in which it seems that democracy has lost some of its cachet as a normative premise for the construction of a constitutional framework for a state. And they have to intervene in a world in which international authority, that is the authority of the international actors that make up this alphabet soup, has been widely questioned all the way down the chain to the very lowest levels. So how does that look? How do you regain access in a world which has suffered this 25 year experiment which seems to have led to rather negative consequences. Well, I mean, for me, you know, I'm interested in how we would think about the new conditions for peace and emancipation given the realities of the modern, advanced, capitalist world that many of us live in. And for me, I will suggest, um, in very general terms, that does allow some of the aspects of the old liberal internationalist dream to be thought about. For example, how do we not only address how do we not only govern the consequences of conflict, but how do we also govern to deal with its roots? In other words, how is government, international, state and local, made much more actively to engage with injustice, historical and geographic injustice, in terms of debates about distribu distributive justice and so on? In other words, is it possible we're now in a a moment, an age, where intervention for peace and progress can transcend many of the hierarchies and the categories that we assumed are natural. Can peace transcend nature? And this 
natural West alien order of sovereign states with the international system um, and so on. How would we ethically understand that process? Now, I can't answer any of those questions, but what I can say, unfortunately, is that the internationals who I've at least had contact with who are thinking about these questions, and they are, by the way, they're still adding their corridors, they're wondering how to regain access, they're wondering what model of states should work better, they're wondering how to regain their right of intervention, how to get resources, how to build political will, how to pacify those complex affected societies around the world. But rather than dealing with those historical injustices, dealing with the problems that emerged from the previous, previous system, testing about 25 years empirically, drawing lessons, and so on, I think that the impetus, their will, is to do what liberal internationalists suggested all those years ago, 100 years ago, is to turn to technology. So instead of there being an ethical re-evaluation of the modes, process, and basis and premise of intervention, and therefore the nature of peace and order itself, given the lessons of those 25 years. And I think there are some things we can say about that, the basis, the, so the social basis of, of um, emancipation, in terms of the solidarities we've seen, the calls for inclusion, pluriversality, um, ways in which institutions would act upon the state, on the social, but also to represent. There are things we can say, even if it's not very. What they're saying is, well, how do we maintain the existing system using new tools? And in a way, this was something of the point of the revolution in military affairs in the 1990s, which was saying, we had this great 1990s moment, it, it turned the world order back into what it should have been, and now we need military tools to maintain that. So this revolution in peace-building affairs has taken a technical turn, which doesn't have much ethical content, I think, from a peace, com peace and conflict perspective. And what they're saying is, how do we intervene? How do we make peace? How do we develop a state? How do we build international? Using the advantages that we have in advanced capitalist societies. And the solution, well, is let me straightforward. As in other sectors, you use the access to data that your advanced economy gives you. You use the technologies that you have, particularly in the confluence between the humanitarian and the military um, sectors, which extend your capacity to intervene, which may well transcend sovereignty itself. And you build, uh, so, so now I'm paraphrasing in an Orwellian way, you build a peace-building command center in some American de desert somewhere, which is able to gather data, process information according to its specific algorithms, in order to understand the early warnings or the late warnings um, of conflicts, and to respond to them, either in terms of distributing knowledge, which is what the old programming of peace building used to do, or exercising the means of violence. And you perhaps also persuade yourself that this type of intervention, which doesn't involve any boots on the ground, whether military, advisory, political, or official, does not actually contravene international law, does not go against sovereignty, and is therefore not a, th a threat to good power structures, only to bad power structures in inverted commas. Now, if you start to think along these lines, it's actually quite scary, and I'm only speculating, but we start to see that, for example, organizations have developed um, very succinct, brief toolkits for building the state. These can be disseminated. Some sectors of some of these advanced states do have the capacity to intervene without any human presence. The whole drone industry um, increasingly being involved in humanitarian delivery um, as well. There are organizations that are developing data systems which help us gather data using different technical fixes, put it all together and map it to see where the flashpoints are, to see what's happening, um, and so on. So the new integrated mission may well be a technological mission, a mission from afar, just like the old air wars, the new peace wars, 
the problem with all of this is it all sounds very good. And, and believe it or not, you know, in, in a way, when I first heard about this, I was in um, a meeting in New York at, at the, um, um, well, actually in the UN, and an Under Secretary General said, what we're thinking about, given that we don't have access to the Arab Spring countries, we've lost access more or less to Iraq, Libya, etc., etc. I mean, there is a constant stream of new conflicts springing up that we don't have access to. And then there are all of these low level conflicts around the world which we cannot have access to, not because we can't get people there and we don't have the material resources, but we just don't have political will. So, one of the things that is being discussed on the nexus between international governments, the global economy, and technology is something called non resident peacekeeping. That is, peacekeeping without any human attributes, or only with distant human attributes. So, clearly, there is thinking about the possibility of joining up the political projects of liberal peace to some degree, because it provides legitimacy because of human rights and democracy, the neoliberal states, because it provides regional stability and state institutions, as well as access to capital, which actually means access to raw materials in the territory. With the current and existing international expertise that exists around peace building, state building, development, peacekeeping, and humanitarian intervention. Now, maybe I'm jumping ahead a few too many steps to see this on the horizon. But of course, as it's happened in other sectors, notably the humanitarian sector, quite recently, I don't see why there's, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be talking about this in 10 years' time as an actual example, a real mission that happens somewhere with no or few or little human presence. No consent, no engagement, just simply the delivery of different modes of intervention. Just to finish up the door, maybe there are positive things here. I mean, maybe the, the use of these technologies, the capacities that they bring, um, can be used also to evaluate and ethically enhance the type of order that, that, that they will produce. <clears throat> in other words, we will move from an aspiration to democracy in the 1880s to the proliferation of democracies in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and then into the 1990s. Um, perhaps that mode of development could be replicated using new methods which will be designed to govern the world as it is today rather than the world as it was in the 19th or 20th century. But it's also possible that there will be a conservative pull because all of these movements are complicated and contested internally. And that very conservative pull inside that technological process will say something like, well actually the current international hierarchy is acceptable. We've got so far Let's not go too much further too quickly. And that would mean that the next stage in thinking about peace, peace beyond the neoliberal state, would not begin to engage with historical injustice. It probably wouldn't engage with global inequality or distributive justice. It probably wouldn't deal with some of the problems that the internationals recognized were problems by the late 1990s until today. That is, the lack of a viable interface with different sites of local political authority in conflict affected societies around the world, whether it's in the customary sector, or the political sector, or local governments, um, or different forms of political arrangements um, other than those that they're, they're used to. In other words, there's technological fix to the problem, the problem of the loss of access, the loss of the right of intervention, could, can be used in a very conservative way to reduce the costs of intervention not to change the premises of intervention, which came to rest with the Iraq Afghanistan situation, and therefore not to rebuild legitimate political authority from the local to the global. Now, that for me would not be a progressive agenda at all for peace building, state building, developments, thinking about peace after the neoliberal state building era. In fact, it would be retrogressive. So, I think what we need to be very, very wary of now, because it's very fashionable across disciplines and across areas, to look to technology to enhance the mission, to provide us with more leverage, 
against existing objectives. But what we've seen in the last 25 years, and what I've tried to show in my kind of quick sweep through the last 100 years of intellectual thinking about progress and order and peace, is that the existing models weren't good enough. They didn't go far enough. They weren't able to accrue legitimacy amongst their different constituencies across their different areas. So it's not just about rethinking the methods, which is the technological fix. We also need to rethink the intellectual and ethical parameters. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this uh, very uh, compelling presentation and uh, uh, stimulating conclusions. I can only imagine that there are a lot of questions. So I open the floor for three, four questions during this first batch, and then we'll have uh, hopefully, hopefully two or three uh, batches, depending on how much time we have. So the floor is open. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you for your very vibrant and dynamic uh, lecture, and you enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I hope the others did as well. A very straightforward question What is your definition of peace? Shall we take a few different questions? Yeah, we take three, four, and then on a menu there. Any others? Yeah. Uh, I'm and I think a lot of come back, uh, conflicted in the area of Kashmir. And the since the childhood, I have, have been hearing about the peace mm. through the peace speaking forces of the nations. But for the last 10 15 years, there is uh, emerging a new phase understanding the peace, which comes from Washington, from London, and ignoring the uh, global, uh, you can say, uh, consensus or image. So, was uh, the is the global image of peace uh, need of the hour, or uh, the interventions by some uh, uh, countries? Uh, which has which have changed the uh, uh, peace approaches into the military inter interventions. So, how you can uh, differentiate these two like these two sides? These two. Thank you. Let's have one more question. No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, thanks for this uh, quite enlightening lecture. And uh, you you talk about in the very term legitimacy very often, but. I, I'm not sure which definition are you using there because you mentioned that you know in, in some countries there are two different classes, different populations, the elite and the population under. But for 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 them, you say there is a gap of legitimacy, and also you know when when the international one uh, is going to to intervene, there is also issue of legitimacy. So I don't I, I'm not sure. Which notion of legitimacy are you using, and whose legitimacy is that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, I'll, I'll um, start with the uh, definition of peace. I mean, I think that um, part of the story of liberal internationalism, as I told it, is that it had a very clear definition of peace, which it refined um, over and over again. <laughs> and if you look at how it develops, it moves from social agency and social emancipation and justice and labor rights and all that stuff um, to the elites who then draw it in, co-opt it, build it into the system, dampen it down, push it back a little bit. And then again, so this constant kind of resistance over the nature of the liberal states and then an attempt to refine um, this kind of encounter between the different power structures that this new and reformed version if you like, of, of the state would Comply. Now, I wouldn't take that as a definition of peace. You know, I think that's a political process and it's evolving and um, shaping. I think one of the things that we see from this period, particularly from 1990, is the attempt to translate that activity into a specific form of state to be applied across conflict zones where there is access, where the right of intervention, this putative right of intervention, has been 
um, applies is a kind of very homogenous, blueprint type model. This is the liberal democratic state. It's a story we hear from you know, the Treaty of Versailles onwards with this kind of <coughs> simplistic historiography. Um, but the actual reality is that there are different types of arrangements which one could call peace. And they're all hybrid. I mean, they all involve different types of state, different social actors working in different areas, from, from religion to custom to technology to the institutions to local government to national government um, and even way beyond that. So this concept of peace is slippery. We can't give it a definition. We can't give it one framework. And one of the problems with that liberal peace framework that we see emerging in the 1990s is that if you're on the receiving end of it, in other words, if you are the subject of liberal peace building, you immediately start to think, well, hang on a second, who asked me? And somebody said um, about um, legitimacy, you said that whose version of peace um, is this? So that on the one hand, there's a sort of normative response that peace has to be representative of difference, um, but it also has to offer standards, standards which are beyond the ones which you currently experience. That's the progressive part um, of peace. So maybe you can say those two things, but to actually define it as a fixed structure, well, you know, maybe the utopian thinkers of the 1920s would like to have a go, but I'd hesitate to do so. I mean, I think it's peace us um, rather than peace, and the question is how do they interact? The best that I think we can do is to say that they have some negative qualities or some positive qualities, hence my negative or positive from peace, which is you know, crudely borrowing from Galtung. So when Galtung wrote about peace, he was really thinking about a left liberal form of peace, that is, a social form of liberal state, which would be democratic, it would um, be a kind of welfare-oriented system of public services with equal access and opportunity and very high levels of equality. <coughs> A very Nordic looking form of peace. And this kind of idea that he had was, you know, we could roll it out to um, Africa, sub Saharan Africa, for example, and that would work. But, you know, in historical practice, when, when it comes to do that, who's going to pay the costs? Well, no one really wants to. I mean, but secondly, does it match with the claims that the populations, the inhabitants of this state, would make? Well, probably not. So, Borrowing from him, I think we can say you know, that kind of impetus is not possible or plausible. So if there is to be a milieu of peace, it's going to be hybrid. It's about encounters, power relations, claims for <coughs> rights and, and resources, as well as obstacles to all of those claims, blockages to all of those claims. And you know, the essence of it, in the end, is that all of these actors in the system who are making these claims and counterclaims, claims for emancipation, blockages against the dismantling of power structures, claims for identity, um, they have to agree to stay in the system. Otherwise, it's not peace, it's violence. And they have to agree to identify the sources of structural violence, that is, the hidden aspects of violence, the discriminatory, unequal aspects of positionality in that system, and to slowly dismantle them. So that tomorrow's setup is better than today's, because that's an important part of legitimacy, isn't it? Legitimacy isn't just, here is a document, and here are your rights, and that's legitimate. And you've signed it, so that's it forever. Because you know, 10 years down the road, you might say, well, actually, I want more. There's more to it than that. We've discovered something else. So it's a fluid kind of um, system. So the whole concept of peace, actually, is it comes from a very Eurocentric, rational, legal, ontological premise that this thing can be fixed in a constitution in a subjectivity, unchanging, <coughs> eternal. I mean, it's, it has exactly the same qualities as the, as the Westphalian sovereign state. And it, in many ways, it's just problem, problematic, which is why Orwell and Foucault saw war and peace as more or less the same thing. Um, and that's what I'm pointing out here with my technological um, possibility. But I think there are other ways in which we could reframe peace as a milieu, in which there are these relations, these interactions, in which Everybody has to be kept away from violence and agree to work discursively, cooperatively through institutions and law, um, through historic institutions as well as rational, legal, Bavarian type institutions, local governments, and, and so on. I think we're at a position now where we could start to write about peace again. But it's taken a, a long period of excavation, empirical analysis, and assessment. 
And yeah, actually, that's kind of what I'm trying to do in this this stuff, this new stuff. Um, obviously, without much success. But on the um, the second question, uh, so the question of, of, of where we are now. I, mean, I assume that you're referring to the stabilisation policy. So the latest buzzwords amongst the international community, and particularly the, um, the, the UK and the US, is stabilization. And you know, the question, um, is this peace? It's not on their agenda. In actual fact, if we look at the recurrence of the word peace in international documentation, it's tailed off radically over the last 10, 10 years. It's crashed. Um, <clears throat> so um, a whole new language of international order production is being used. And it starts with the terrorism counterinsurgency um, kind of language of, of the US military um, and goes into the sort of development participation type um, language um, and goes in briefly into some of the language in the, uh, um, the UN system um, also about representation, um, the local and so on. But the, the UK military and some of the UK's allies have been pushing this idea of stabilization and it's really a very retrogressive step again. This is where historically we can see that power has met its match. So the attempt to build a, an international system out of um, kind of the foundations that were left um, at the end of the Cold War um, was quite ambitious. It ran against many of the different <laughs> flows of international order, physical, economic, social. Um, and so on. It was a kind of reformist system. Um, it was all about changing the subject, changing the state, re reinforcing and buttressing um, the international. And this is what these stabilization missions do. So in the thinking of, of the UK military, and I was actually last week at a meeting discussing this new-ish sort of agenda, and um, what they, when they look at the world, they don't see anything that should be changed. So they're not looking at the state system as problematic. They're not looking at the weaknesses or inadequacies of the UN framework. They're not looking at historical flashpoints that have repeated themselves through history, which could be dealt with. They're not looking at global capital or, or any of those things. They're very simply looking at the territorial arrangements of human populations and the ways in which these should be, according to the geopolitical map that we've all internalized psychologically over the last 50 years or I suppose you know, 25 years, anyway, definitely, um, and seeing this as a status quo which needs to be maintained. So there's no historical issue, there's no justice issue, there's no inequality issue. Um, it's about managing human populations within the existing state system using the lightest forms of counterinsurgency. Um, they can imagine designs for um, you know, revolutionary military forces with more access to <laughs> certain forms of technology than ever before. So intervention for them is about maintaining the system. It's very conservative. They're not even thinking about the political ramifications of keeping the system as it is, because for them, what they're doing is preventing further flashpoints, prevent, preventing further obstacles and problems from developing. Emerging. So the stabilization of world order, I think, is actually retrogressive um, in, in many ways. But this is where they've realized that actually they can't, they don't think they could do more. Or they've realized they don't want to do more. So this is something to watch out for, I think. But on the question of legitimacy, I mean, this is a really good and um, important question. I don't think that the list strong legitimacy is all that developed, um, actually, because when I, when I started thinking about it, and you know, like many others, I went to the literature and I had a look, and there's a scattering of, of important articles um, which have been written on this. And they're rather barbarian in nature and, and neoliberal in methodology, um, too. And so what I started to think about was connecting the legitimacy to what I saw as being, from a peace perspective, key sites of authority in today's world. And these, um, for me, were at three main levels. Now, these aren't hard and fast categories. They're sites, they're fuzzy sites around which there are networks and relationships and power relations and um, circulating. But this, this, for me, was the local and the social. And it's, it's forms of legitimacy range across a whole different set of zones. 
from identity and religion to practice and custom and tradition into many different areas, security, law, um, ways in which one thinks about one's leisure time, access to services, and, and so on. A complex construction of legitimacy, which, I mean, there are literatures on, on these things, but um, at least in my kind of skating over the top of the literature, I didn't see um, much that really made me feel that it was contemporary. But anyway, um, the state. Now, the state is much more easy, it's much easier to theorize um, from, the, from the point of view of legitimacy and legality, because there's quite a big literature um, on this, from the international law perspective and also from the sociological perspective, um, and so on. And then the international, a small literature but growing, um, you know, connected either to um, world governments, to international law, um, or to global governments, um, and so on. And you know, relating to either the social, the rights of the social, or to the state and the regulatory framework um, in which the state operates. So these are different sites of um, legitimacy, which I thought, in very general terms, it's important to think about. Because if you think about that 100 years that I, I talked about in my talk from the 19-teens until today, all of these have been seen as important sites <coughs> of peace. Civil war, civil peace. State level interstate war, state peace, peace agreements, constitutional frameworks, and all that stuff. And then the UN system, the League of Nations, UN system, and then the additions to global government since um, 1990. So it seems to me that these are three historically situated, grounded sites of legitimacy, which are used in different ways to <coughs> construct authority and therefore exercise power, different types of power, and for um, different reasons, producing different forms of peace. And, you know, they're often conflicting. So what you might see as social order or social peace may not fit with what, what is defined as a state level peace and may not fit with a, with a liberal peace system, the international um, level. And then there are questions of procedure, action, and so on, which we can um, bring into this uh, as well. Thank you very much. Let's take three questions more. Yes, Mr. Wu. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So, on the idea of the flat light on technology fixing the legitimacy gap, I mean, I, I like technology as much as anyone else, but I'm a bit suspicious on the idea of technology on its own be able to fix a, a problem that seems to be inherently political, political mm -hmm. in the sense of, uh, I mean, are, aren't we actually? Uh, highly politics and ideology behind a wall of technology and bureaucracy, so where and at the same time the problem is still there. I mean, it's not only not only because we have someone far away from the conflict, far away from the crisis, uh, in front of a computer uh, with, a, with a whole set of data, um, that doesn't mean that there is not an agenda behind it. There's not politics behind it. It's just a comment. On Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. <coughs> uh, thank you for uh, the interesting presentation. Um, my, my question is uh, you mentioned about uh, structural violence and structural war. Um, do you think structural peace will solve uh, the global governance? Are we having a third question? Okay, let's take those two. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my my understanding of this possibility, which is over the horizon, where where technology um, creates the if you like the the interventionary capacity that the material capacities of the traditional tools of the nineteen nineties <laughs> failed to have. Um, it, it, it's not that it fixes legitimacy. That's the claim that's being made about it. But it's not that it would fix legitimacy. In fact, I think quite the reverse. I think it might undermine um, legitimacy. Now, you know, what we see in these interventions, in, in many cases, is that they're welcomed um, in the 1990s and so on. You know, people do want to have human rights. They do want to have prospects of prosperity. They would like to have a better life for their families and children. Um, and they would like to be freed of existing power structures which exploit them. And our predatory. Um, 
Of course, it does more to it than that. So in, in our sort of reductionist interventionary way, we were thinking they wanted those things, but not the child. So everything else was, was peripheral um, and, and marginal. And we we're also thinking that the power structures would no longer be able to really oppose the intervention. <coughs> now, if we were to think about refining um, these strategies that have been developed and used by the international actors in the international system, um, whether military or developmental and, and so on, that's a completely different story to coming up with new technological methods which gain access in order for you to continue with the standard operating procedures of intervention from the 2000s. And my feeling is, um, I mean, particularly in the UN system, there's a lot of opposition to neoliberal state building. Although some of them had to go along with it in the 2000s because that was a global hegemonic stance and all that kind of thing, um, people were not happy and were only really doing it to maintain their jobs um, and maintain perhaps their institutions. But they were keeping alive a slightly more liberal or even more emancipatory because you know, quite a lot of these people have a different technological background dream in, in the background. The problem is that with this technological fix, and again, I'm really quite speculating, but it hasn't been developed in the system. It's not coming from inside the architecture of peace building, of, of global governance, of diplomacy. Um, it's not even really coming from inside the international, uh, the military architecture. It's actually coming from a kind of confluence between global technological capital and some quarters in those institutional frameworks. Um, so, I mean, you know, to be very crude about it, it's about selling technology um, to extend hegemonic power in order to prevent the unpicking of the current historical hierarchy that we, we live in. Now, that, to me, runs completely against the grain the train of thinking about peace, which was moving increasingly into, well, we have to deal with social justice, historical injustice, distributive justice, environmental sustainability, a complete repositioning of the debate of peace, even in formal policy um, documentation, away from peace is you know, a state agreement between either with its own constituencies or with another state, to peace is a sustainable global positionality, which requires all of these ongoing mediations between nature, between the environment, between different forms of power, different uh, issue areas. All that stuff. This is a way of avoiding all of that. It's kind of myopia, myopia, technological myopia. And if I can just give you a kind of caveat as an example, one of the things, one of the examples that I heard in relation to this was about universities and the MOOC. I really heard about MOOCs, it's a mass, massive online course as well. Anyway, I mean, one of the kind of key names who was behind um, rolling out the MOOCs, to use that awful neoliberal language. Um, to um, American Ivy League universities, um, <clears throat> with, you know, very contradictory consequences, some good, some bad. Um, his underlying premise for the MOOC, which we think, as the subject of the MOOCs, the people who would experience them from afar, would be to democratize education, from his perspective, was not to democratize education, but to centralize it. So whereas we want to all go to Harvard and hear you know, um, Michael Sandel talking about international justice, what Harvard wants is the whole world to hear about Michael Sandel talking about international justice. And that's a normative exchange in which power relations are at play. Okay, do you see that? So this guy who, who developed the MOOCs, particularly this one from Michael Sandel, says um, in a very telling statement, he said, in 50 years time, there'll only be 10 universities left in the world. I'll be teaching the world in the United States now, of course, I'm exaggerating, but you can see how this impulse, this conservative impulse to centralize power, power and knowledge, authority and, and, and legitimacy, that's what the 1990s saw that. The 2000s was a response, a reaction to that, a series of resistances to it, a retraction of the interventionary impulse. And now we're at the technological stage where there is this kind of hope that we can rescue the project with technology. But the project has moved out of them ethical political terrain if that happens. I will actually use my position to ask a question myself. <laughs>
and then I'll open the floor one last time, see if there is one more other question. So the question is, what is there left of the um, uh, kind of a progressive agenda uh, uh, of peace? Because you start off the history you cover by showing that uh, initially uh, discourses of peace were infused with political ideologies focusing on progress. Uh, and whereas you show that, uh, or at least claim that these progressive agendas or some form of progressive agenda still is present in contemporary peace discourses, the feeling when one gets when listening to you is that it's, it is becoming less about making the world a better place, uh, or at least it's less about the idea that it would be possible to make the world a better place, and more about the idea of trying to make sure it doesn't become worse, uh, with justifications like uh, stopping war crimes and uh, put an end to violations of human rights, etc., more than having like a consensual or relatively consensual political ideology uh, amongst the community developing these practices on what peace would be. So one gets the idea that it's, it's more like a negative consensus around what has to be done in order, in order to avoid things getting worse, then it's about really trying to get things to get better and hence to trigger some kind of progress. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the forward question. Um, is there anything left of, this progr of those progressive agendas is one question. And then what's new is, is a related question. Is there anything new um, also? I, mean, I think that, um, we obviously don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater to, to use a, a, a English or cliche, which is just as bad as neoliberal stuff. Um, you know, all of this stuff about social agency, social agency and the clever ways in which it mobilizes, the hidden silence, sometimes public, ways in which it mobilizes through because of solidarity for things which it comes to term as rights and expansion of rights in different sectors, whether it's pluralism in religion, whether it's freedom and liberty in some ways, um, whether it's labor rights, whether it's access to services, whether it's gender equality, um, and how that is scaled up to the international and recycled out into um, the rest of the world. I think that was, that is, it was, and it is an important insight, a way of thinking about um, how one could, in a democratic situation, build an attract attraction, a physical, a physically attractive discourse, a framework for bringing people in to the fold, bringing people into a system in which differences can be opened up, but not attacked. <coughs> and that agenda, I think, is still there. I think it's, it's in many ways problematic because it's kind of simplification of the flows of power and power relations and what's possible and how we understand rights and, and so on. But I think unless that's, unless we have a capacity now to think about peace across both time and space, so in that old system of, of thinking about peace in a progressive way, peace was thought about really in terms of building a state in the international community along the lines advocated by different groups in, in society. And though they may be drawing experience, um, what they were really doing was responding to their contemporary situations. So they respond to the materiality of sub subjectivity now in order to build the state and the international. Well, I think if we look at many of the conflict effects of societies in which we work and so on, we can see that political subjectivity is not contemporaneous. It's not just about now. It has a whole series of dimensions, some of which are temporal, and some of which are kind of geopolitical, some of which are spatial. And that's less represented in the old progressive agenda. So as I say, you know, thinking about positionality in terms of time, space, environment, sustainability, um, and all of those sorts of things. But also, in a kind of counterfactual way, thinking about um, you know, the world beyond the institutional settings and the legal frameworks um, that we have. What's the fail set? What's the backup? You see, at the moment, we have a peace system, an international architecture, which has no backup. There's, there's a thin line between us, that system, and the oblivion beyond it. So, in other words, what we're doing now is thinking about building not just multiple interlocking kind of confederal international systems which interact to represent different forms of peace, different types of states, different forms of political subjectivity, um, and to offer them some kind of stability today and better, a better tomorrow. But we're also thinking about how we lock into that system other systems. 
And some of those systems may be historical. They may, may be related to different forms of political subjectivity. You know, people, um, it's quite amazing, but even if you think about a very advanced modern capitalist Western society, like the UK, there are actually different forms of political authority. Not just the modern state and the capitalist economy, but different and competing forms of political authority, which actually do an awful lot for people in different communities in the UK, but have no space in, in the modern states. And I think that's a bit of a problem. And so we can look to those different systems, perhaps, and bring them in, because they form different functions. They came from somewhere, they're organic, they came from somewhere for a reason. Now, I mean, a shortcut to all of that is equality across time and space, or equa liberty, perhaps. But, you know, any shortcut is reductionist and problematic, because it's a complex situation. Thank you very much. Do we have one last question? Mm -hmm. Short one, in that case. Before we thank uh, Oliver Richmond, I would like to uh, announce that uh, the next uh, public lecture that would take place in this uh, University of Kent public lecture series will take place on December the 3rd uh, of this year uh, and will be given by Professor Mick Dillon, uh, which with an as intriguing title as usual. Uh, it is Bush, Blair and the Baroque, the Politics and Aesthetics of Sovereign Failure. Uh, so this is on December the 3rd from 2 to 4. All that remains to be done now is to thank very much Oliver Richmond for his very uh, stimulating presentation. <laughs> and to go to the reception, which is just here. Thank you.